stream. We are dreamed into existence. What we do with that dream is up to us. This is Stream. I am Jessica Deruta, and I share with you my stream of consciousness. You may find Stream on my blog at trustpsyche.com and on my YouTube channel, Jessica Deruta. Please take what serves you and leave the rest. Let us begin. How we dream is as important as what we dream, for the what of the dream knows itself through the how. Hey everyone, welcome to Stream 16. Today is March 5th, 2020. And this stream is coming to you super fresh as I woke up this morning and rolled out of bed and turned to Dr. Travis Deruta. That's right, he's become a doctor since the last time uh, he was on this show and said, will you please do a stream with me today? And at first he said no and I dealt with my momentary feelings of rejection and but because I'm such a sweet talker and he had his morning tea he then surprised me as he often does and says why yes Jessica I would love to come on to your show today so please welcome Dr. D. Thank you for having me Jessica <laughs> so happy to be here. Uh, I'm so happy you're here with me. We are in our kitchen here in Siesta Key and we want to talk about a really rare planetary alignment that's happening right now. And the reason why I asked Travis to join me today was because he is a living specimen of this alignment. So as all of you know, Saturn and Pluto are conjunct in the sign of Capricorn right now. And um, they've been conjunct, if you're using a 15 degree orb of influence for world, world transits outer planetary alignments, which we use, since February of 2018. And they go through um, all the way December 2021. But they're the most exact, the most tightest, um, 2019 and the rest of this year, 2020. But what happened at the beginning of this year of 2020 is Jupiter came in and formed an even um, more rare triple conjunction of Jupiter, Saturn, and Pluto. However, this month of March and all the way till about April 18th, the inner planet of Mars has come in and formed a quadruple conjunction of Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Pluto. The last time these four planets were conjunct was 1982 when Travis was born. So Travis is born with these four planets conjunct and for the first time 37 years later since he was born they're conjunct again. So I wanted you to come in and ha for us to have an awesome conversation about what these four energies are all about together. That sounds great. So today the moon is also um, at 19 degrees Cancer, opposite the stellium in Capricorn, which happens to be your loon, lunar return. Your moon's at 17 degrees Cancer. And uh, as you noted earlier, uh, Venus and Uranus are also conjunct today in Taurus. And that was the alignment that we discussed last time I was on stream. Yeah, you were on stream 10 and we talked about the metaphysics of relationship. So if you guys haven't heard that one, go ahead and check it out. And Travis and I um, focused on the Venus-Uranus archetypal combination um, because he's born with it and it's in our synastry. And we gave our whole kind of metaphysical understanding of how we see um, relationship as being um, the bedrock and pervasive theme of our cosmology. 
And this little stream this morning is a nice surprise in our relationship. <laughs> Very appropriate for the Venus Uranus in the sky today. Oh, that's true. I did surprise you, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> What's new? <laughs> but you like it, right? Yeah, of course I like it. Mostly. Always. Well, you resist a little bit at first, though. On a deep level, I like it. On a deep level, you like it, but on a surface level, you resist. It's true, I do. And I know it's good for me, so I lean into it. Well, your moon and your birth chart is square your Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Pluto alignment. That's right. I'm very tight with my Saturn. And so there sometimes can be a little bit of an emotional resistance to what otherwise could be quite explosive. <laughs> yeah, a staid, a staid quality. I think it's certainly a, a dialectic in my own chart. The moon Saturn on the one hand and Venus opposite Uranus on the other. And so I find myself sometimes shifting back and forth between these poles of my my state, my staid self that doesn't want to go outside the boundaries and ruffle too many feathers, but then something else welling up inside that wants to knock it all down, <laughs> make it wild. Well, what poles do I go back and forth between? Well, what do you notice about me? Well, your, your moon in Aries and your moon Uranus is very playful, very youthful, energetic energy. Um, but your Capricorn self also has a hardworking, ambitious stick to that puts structures in place. And there's, I always see this oscillation between the, between the young child and the wise old woman. <laughs> Sometimes even second to second <laughs> or at the same time. Oh my goodness, that must be fun for you. <laughs> it's my favorite. I like that. I like I like hearing you describe. It's like you're my child and my grandmother at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> That's sexy. <laughs> um, neither one of those typically have good breasts, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> that's a... Which is not the case. <laughs> oh, oh, you're so sweet. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, so kind of to, to bring us back to the Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Pluto, um, you know, just to kind of give context of how rare this time is. Um, and so the specifically Saturn and Pluto make a conjunction roughly every 35 years. And they do so for about three to four years um, at a time, but you know, the most strong for about two years. So this is the first time since you're born that they're conjunct, but Jupiter is there. So to have, so to have three plant, planets conjunct, you know, is, is pretty rare by itself. And this is what our friend Matthew Stelzner points out is the last time before 1982 that Jupiter, Saturn, and Pluto were conjunct. You have to go back 700 years. That's a really long time. And I think he says that you have to go forward 400 years to see it again. So to me, there's a very um, interesting significance that we're getting these, you know, two um, alignments happening so close together. But then with Mars involved, mm -hmm. we have this inner planet coming in, activating and catalyzing as inner planets do when they come onto outer planetary alignments and bringing forward to the world stage and all of our personal lives, this energy. So let's kind of break down a little bit how we see these four planets together because it's, it's hard for anybody to hold or grok what it means to have four planets conjunct. Um, sure. So what I like to do is I like to start from the outer planets and move my way in. So the first thing is to understand the Saturn-Pluto conjunction, which you and I have both given talks on, right? Mm -hmm. I did one on the Great Reckoning and you did one on the Transformations of Time, which you can find on the Trust Psyche YouTube channel. But I really like this idea of the Great Reckoning. We were just talking about this. Sure. What I like about the Great Reckoning is bringing in the dimension of Saturn that relates to karma and time, mm -hmm. right? You can't have karma without time. And part of what karma is, a significant part of it, is that it, it is cause and effect, right? And then the consequences of the cause and effect. And so we have karma on a personal level of our own lifelong biography. 
and you can go back to understanding that from the day you were born. But Pluto brings in this dimension of depth and ancientness. So with Saturn and Pluto, you get like ancient time, deep history, deep time. And so it's not just the karma of this one life, but it's the karma of going back lifetimes of your soul's evolution. It's the karma of your ancestry, the lineage of people that you come from, um, the inheritance and the epigenetics that come from that which we can also see in the birth chart. And then we could do that on larger scales of people. We could do that for um, entire nations and the history of the civilization coming together, the government, the laws, the norms, the, the traditions that shape society, which is also what Saturn relates to. And then we can go back even further in time and understand it on you know the whole um, scale of human evolution and understanding how over the past you know millions of years the human being has come into the form that it's in now so we have all these different dimensions and layers of time karma the past and then pluto bringing in both the deepness of it the ancientness of it and the evolution of it which of course that is also what karma points to is its evolutionary impulse and i like what you were saying earlier about uh how under saturn pluto we kind of we see all these time scales kind of lining up and that we're sort of in a, a kind of nodal point now where these different phase patterns are are intersecting with one another so sometimes sometimes in life you you find yourself more drawn to paying attention to the political stage or kind of large moments in history and you say, wow, this is, a, this is really a transformational moment on that scale of time. And in other moments, we're, we're more wrapped up with our, our inner life and our personal life and you say, wow, this is really a, a moment of change and a turning point in my personal life. But I think under Saturn Pluto, we feel how those different time scales relate to one another. And I know for us and for a lot of other folks we've talked to, it feels like the change and the turn of corner and the intensity is happening on all those time scales at once. Mm. It's as if this is a this is a nodal point where really long waveforms and really short waveforms are all lining up. The crests and the troughs are just you know coming together, and I really feel like big changes in our personal life are being reflected, and big changes on the world stage, and it feels like there's a kind of transparency, a, a diaphanousness between those that suddenly I can see the energy manifesting on all those different time scales at once. Oh, I like this, what you're saying. I mean, earlier you described it as these kind of nested echoes mm. of one another. And for me, the convergence of the personal and the collective is mm. part of what's making this moment feel so saturated. Saturn Pluto has this quality of making time feel very concentrated. And there's a richness in that, but there's also a density in that. Mm. You know, Saturn being space and time and Pluto deepening and intensifying often to an extreme state, whatever it touches, it creates this quality of space and time feeling very, very, very compressed. And there's a density in that. And I think most people are feeling the, the heaviness and the weightiness of the moment, both the heaviness as in the the the, the physical pressures of what's happening in the world today, um, but also the um, kind of heaviness of the weight and responsibility that every action and decision that we make, mm -hmm. both as individuals, then as families and groups of people, and then, you know, society at large or the entire government is having on the rest of the world. I mean, we're coming now uh, out of Super Tuesday here in the United States, um, and the political stage is extremely intense right now as we um, enter into the Democratic, you know, primary. And uh, the coronavirus has now gone around the entire world. Um, the World Health Organization today says that there's been 3,200 deaths and we're at about 3.4% death rate. And the pandemic, you know, uh, pan meaning all, all endemic, 
Demic, I believe, comes from demos, the word for people in Greek. So, you know, all people, right? We, we, we talk about being a global civilization for the first time in human history. And we are now interconnected as one. Um, at first, you could see this uh, through most clearly the internet and social media where we now see videos and photos and stories every day from all around the world. People being able, for the most part, to be able to post and that's connecting us and then I think fostering not only greater awareness but greater empathy. But now what's a pandemic? A pandemic says, hey, we are biologically, physiologically, interconnected for better or worse and there's nothing like a virus to remind us of that and for better or worse right jupiter saturn mm. oh i like that and i think that we we really feel the the contrary conflicting forces of, of jupiter and saturn here expansion and contraction and we see it i really feel it on the political stage you know this 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 thing that's it's burgeoning outward but also it's being pushed inward and there's just this this struggle this strife that's trying to find resolution it's felt it's felt really dark for a while here under trump and i felt surges of hope during this during this political campaign jupiter. as jupiter starts to come in yeah. but we're feeling the recoil too and it's going back and forth and it's it's really uncertain what's going to shake out here and I think one thing that's nice to note, uh, if we look back to, to ancient astrology before the discovery of the outer planets, Jupiter-Saturn was the, uh, the most rare, longest alignment, and it was kind of the crowning, the crowning alignment, Jupiter-Saturn, the two most outer planets, and they were kind of the two basic contrary principles of astrology. I think a lot of times, perhaps now we think more of, of Saturn and, and Neptune, as carrying this polarity and dialectic, but Jupiter Saturn here is really potent in this time, and I think it's good good to remember. You know, this was the alignment that they said perhaps was the star of Bethlehem that led the the Magi to the Christ, and so it's a it's really a potent hmm. alignment with a long history. I want to take a second with that because what you're saying is is that. You know, to the ancients, Jupiter and Saturn were the last two planets that you could see. Mm -hmm. They were the outer planets back then. Absolutely. Because we couldn't see the trans-Saturnian planets, right? Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. And these two, Jupiter and Saturn, form a conjunction about every 12 years. So at that time, the scales of time were happening on, you know, about a 12-year cycle. We were also living a lot less uh, long at that time so 12 years was actually a really long time now this saturn pluto alignment that we're focusing on as well you know this that 35 year cycle that is essentially tripling the way that we're measuring archetypal time essentially here in the cycles of time but i want to take a moment and focus on what you said about jupiter saturn and the star of bethlehem and the magi could you just say a little bit about like symbolically what that evokes for you? And just thinking about, you know, either Christ, Christ consciousness, or maybe some Jupiter Saturn themes that come up? Well, the first thing that comes to mind here is, um, I mean, in terms of Christ, it's the, it's the theme of, of incarnation, that there's the, the blessings of Jupiter that the savior brings but the savior brings it through incarnation christ is the symbol of the god human it's it's the bringing together of the two worlds of the opposites and so there's really a, a kind of alchemy that goes on but it's for better and worse right the the, the savior comes but the savior must be crucified and die to achieve the savior's mission so symbolically in the Jupiter Saturn, better or worse, mm. there's a theme. There's a theme here that you're gonna have to eat your vegetables first before you get dessert, <laughs> <laughs> or or some something even-handed, something where Jupiter can't just come in and rain down blessings mm. without 
passing through the eye of the needle first. Mm. Oh, I like that. That actually is very calming for me in my belly. Mm. Um, so, you know, something that you mentioned earlier that struck me was thinking about for if we could all visualize for a moment Saturn in between Jupiter and Pluto as it is well as it actually is in the solar system but just mm. to kind of imagine that for a second and you know Jupiter's quality is to expand and magnify to amplify right it takes everything over the top makes it really big really really huge Pluto makes everything titanic drives it deepens it but it also makes it massive in a different way mm -hmm. and again it can have this kind of extreme quality to it so i kind of just get this image of like saturn like sandwiched in between this like major expansive quality and then this like rah, like grinding really deep and intense quality right it's almost like jupiter is breadth and pluto is depth mm. and saturn is just being expanded along all the axes at the same time and it's resisting that expansion with its contracting quality yeah i think it it, it, it it's interesting the, the the inherent paradox that saturn carries I, I feel like in a way for me saturn i don't even know maybe even more so for pluto like because pluto contains both death and rebirth mm -hmm. right destruction and creation for some reason the death rebirth mystery is easier for my poetic imagination to hold. Saturn, I actually think stretches, at least me, more to hold the inherent paradox that mm -hmm. at the same time, it can limit and negate and suppress and reject or deny as it simultaneously sculpts and molds and gives form and incarnates, as you say. Mm -hmm. It's both the obstacle and the ability to manifest. And I think that's difficult for the mind to hold that understanding. Absolutely. And it can, it can flip in a second. It's hard, it's, mm. it's hard to say how it's going to manifest. It's hard to say how, how, to, draw, how to draw out Certain those incarnational sides it. versus being stuck by Saturn. And why does it manifest as one rather than the other? Mm. There is really an enigma there. Hmm. What I really like about uh, this, this title, The Great Reckoning, mm. that we've been talking about is that I think it carries really well these positive and negative and other sort of polar qualities. It's, you know, the, the Great Reckoning can be, oh my, oh my gosh, you know, uh, this, is the, this is the judgment day. It carries these kind of qualities of, of fear that every you know everything you've ever done wrong may you know, it's it's time to settle accounts, but the great reckoning is also all the wrongs that have ever been done to you, yeah. and the, the accounts are going to be settled. And I th I think it it carries well. The themes and this this feeling of both that we're going through right now. I mean, as you say that, it takes me back into a uh, medicine ceremony. And like part of my experience in doing ceremony is that kind of mm. feeling of um, hmm, being stretched, I was going to say ripped apart, <laughs> <laughs> to a place to have to hold both of those things, right? right. The reckoning of... Um, encountering the consequences of the decisions that have been made positively and negatively in the past, right, that I have made and, and, and having to face that, to confront that, right, and hopefully take responsibility for that, which is often a, an uncomfortable and painful process mm -hmm. while simultaneously seeing at times the wrongdoings that others have done to me and the painfulness of the receiving end of that and it's like stretching myself to hold both. And like, how do we not collapse, which is a Saturn, in a way, a Saturn Pluto theme, collapse, you know, in the face of that level of confronting ourselves and, and confronting the past, which, you know, Saturn Pluto, I think, in a way, more than anything, is about confronting our past personally and collectively. I mean, when you talk about the shadow, 
which mm -hmm. Saturn Pluto most relates to, what is the shadow and what is shadow work? A lot of what the shadow is, is facing the past in the present moment and all the dimensions and facets of that. And the one thing that I've been noticing, especially since Jupiter has come into the alignment, amplifying this whole process, is there's just no hiding or escaping from our past. Absolutely. We are, we are decision-making beings. We're existential beings. We're thrown into our, our life and we're thrown into time. And time has an arrow to it. It has a directionality, right? It, it moves forward. And we make decisions every day. And the consequences of those decisions are like a tail, a trail that, that build up behind us. And when you talk about dealing with the past, right, we have to deal with the past. We have to deal with decisions that we've made and the things that have happened to us. And those are irre irreversible. We're put into the situation where we have to decide, but we have to decide without knowing what's going to happen based on those decisions. And that's, that's our existential predicament. And I think that under Saturn Pluto, it's shown to us most clearly where we face this existential predicament of what it means to be human. Well, I think that's interesting then using the word transparency, right? It's like we're becoming transparent to our own past. Exactly. And I, f I find that true on a personal level. Um, and I know that my family, for example, is really going through that and what's happening uh, there. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's this great reckoning of the past. Things that happened decades ago are coming out to be yeah. faced, to be metabolized. Right? Pluto has this um, quality of, of, of metabolization and composting, right? It's, it's the circle of life. It's the movement, the churning of things. And when it comes with Saturn, it's like really brings that into the physical world. And, you know, it's not just karma and time, but it's just like the very real structures that make up our life. And that could be the family structure, that could be the work structure, that could be the relationship structure. And so that's happening, not just for me, I know that that's happening for so many of my clients right now. It's this very deep confronting of the past. But on a collective level, right. that is exactly what is happening right now. And you could take that in for sure here in America, and I believe in the Western world, you're looking at having to confront things like patriarchy mm -hmm. and white supremacy and the institutions of racism and sexism and homophobia and xenophobia. This level of reckoning is like, no, you can't escape the fact that America is built on the genocide of Native Americans Absolutely. and that we stole and captured Africans and brought them over here on slave ships and made them, you know, build up a lot of our wealth that we now profit from in America today as the world's most powerful, wealthy empire. That is the great reckoning. Yes. And what you're seeing socially and politically right now are people are speaking to that dimension of our ancient history and saying, no, until this is addressed, until this is digested and metabolized and integrated and brought in, which is what Saturn Pluto wants, we cannot actually move forward, not just socially, right? And that dimension of Jupiter Saturn that relates to social justice mm -hmm. and the evolution of that process with Pluto, but ecologically, we can't move forward. We, there cannot actually be an ecological redemption without the addressing of the things that have happened in the past. And I think that if you take that both literally and symbolically and apply it to our individual lives, it's a really good template for what we are each being asked to do right now. And this is again, the, sy the systemic nature that's being brought out by everything that's going on, that it's that actually racial justice, ecological justice are not disconnected issues. We're, we're seeing more and more as Trump pulls all these poisons to the surface, it's clearer and clearer how our bigotry on personal and collective levels 
applies no less to the planet than it does to how we treat women, how we treat minorities. That these are related issues that need to be addressed in tandem. And I'm realizing that the level of passion that we're speaking about these topics and the kind of forcefulness behind it is the Mars. Coming in. And this, this is what the Mars here in the month of March and through the middle of April is really about. It, Mars brings things to a head. Right, mm -hmm. It's a phallic, young, masculine, assertive, direct energy that activates and catalyzes whatever it touches. It leaps forward, it leaps out, it pushes things forward. It's the third chakra, it's our will. And you know, he, I love this. I, I love Travis's uh, one-liners. You know, you have Mercury on us and you just bring out these great one-liners. I've been just trying to write them down, but it's hard to do. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, last night you were like, when are we gonna rise above the third chakra? And I was just like, and that just sums it up right there. When are we gonna get beyond the third chakra? Like, come on, people. We've mastered the whole conquer and conflict and war. Good job, weapons of mass destruction. What are we gonna live in endless wars for the rest of our life? Is the god of war going to be the ruling predominant consciousness of humanity? Or are we going to rise up through the third chakra into the fourth of the heart. Compassion, empathy, interconnection, love, belonging, right? This is, I think, if we had to distill it into one thing, this is what we're fighting for more than anything else, being alive today. Absolutely, and on the personal and the collective level, when, when, is, when is power going to stop being the driving force in both both on the collective world stage, but also in our personal relationships with one another and in the workplace, in all the ways that we engage with one another and with the wider world around us. How can we make compassion the driving force? This is the deep question. This is a deep question, which I think it's fair to say that the brink of humanity <laughs> depends on whether or not we can do that. I mean, it's yeah, it's almost a cliche at this point, but it's <laughs> I think it's still deeply relevant. I mean, way back, way back in uh, Woody Allen's Annie Hall, Woody Allen, who's a despicable human being, you know, he makes the same joke. I just, I just can't quite, you know, my, I can't remember if he says his yoga teacher or his therapist, I can't quite turn the third to the fourth chakra. Hmm. People, you know, we've been talking about this for ages, but I think we keep talking about it and it feels like a cliche because it is the central issue of the millennium. <laughs> I mean, I guess what you just made me realize is like kind of one of my like most fun, sexy, challenging practices right now is how to bring the fourth of the heart of love um, to the lower chakras, right? Like we can often think of the ascension, like from the root, Saturn, mm, up through like the that. second, Pluto, through the third, Mars, into the heart, the fourth, Venus. And it's like, what about bringing Venus down? Absolutely. Down through the third, through the second, through the first. I think it's so important to be wary of these tendencies towards an up and out cosmology. Yes, the, the ascension that's somehow going to leave this you know, dirty, messy world behind, that's gonna leave these complicated bodies behind. That's, that's not what we're going for. We're not trying to escape from the difficult messiness of this embodied life. I think a big part of our, our mission, our learning, what we're trying to do here is to, to bring it down, as you're saying, and to embrace body and finitude and limitation in a way that we can, we can, we can make peace instead of trying to escape being human yeah <laughs> i mean really right i mean first of all the celebration of the body jupiter saturn hmm. right jupiter is where we celebrate things and saturn has a corporal quality to it right incarnation of the flesh and blood and this oft often relates to, uh you know what we were saying earlier about christ but it's like yeah the body of christ right if God chose or the goddess chose 
to incarnate into the flesh, into the realm of Saturn, where we are on the physical earth in space and time, which includes karma, consequences, story, evolution, right? An arrow of, of, of trajectory. Then the corporal, in a way, is the most holy in this dimension, in the sense that it is the vessel and the vehicle through which the spirit, the divine incarnates, right? We're talking about imminence here. And with Saturn, Pluto, this kind of growing deep, deep into the earth, deep roots, right? It's, it's, it's going down through the base of the tree, going deep into the roots, going deep into the soil and, and having to honor and acknowledge that that's where life begins and comes from. If we just focus on the branches and we just focus on the growth of the up and out movement, then we're not actually understanding how life is possible, which is from a deep rooted embodied foundation. And I think that Saturn Pluto really makes us human. Absolutely. And and, and I want to actually do a podcast on being human with Saturn Pluto because one thing that I notice so much happening in my work with my clients is I'm spending a lot of time normalizing the human experience. Mm. To be human is to have limitations. To be human means that we have boundaries. We have feelings. We have emotions, (laughs) right? And sometimes those aren't pleasant. We have experiences of hatred and disgust and jealousy and envy, right? And these are like considered the quote unquote darker aspects of being human, which means that there's a tendency for there to be a lot of shame around them. And when we're shameful of something, we tend to hide it. We tend to veil it. We tend to cover it. Right. That's what in part you know, Saturn Pluto does. I mean, it really relates to shame and to repression and to hiding things. Right. And yeah, and then we want to deny our bodies, deny our emotions. And I think this translates into astrology. Sometimes people don't want to, people want to deny Saturn. They want to deny Pluto, the planets associated with the two lowest chakras. But people love talking about Uranus and Neptune, the planets associated with the two upper chakras. And I feel like the same kind of up and out, let's forget the messy stuff. I don't want to deal with the hard stuff. I just want to have transcendent experiences. I just want to be connected to the divine. I think this is a, this is a limiting of astrology and it's a limiting of our capacities as human beings. It's a limiting of the full spectrum of existence and of archetypal existence. And so I love what you're saying about bring, you know, bringing it down instead of just coming up. And if we, if we think about that nexus there between the, the fourth and the third chakra, between Venus and Mars, mm. what we're doing here is the dance, is the dance of mm. Venus and Mars. I like that. And that's, you know, that's where kind of the center point, where, where, we're, where we're moving now. And so we're not just trying to move up into the heart, but we're trying to, to bring the heart down so that it permeates all that we do in all of our embodied relations. Mm, oh, I like that. Yeah, that just it feels really grounding. It feels centering. And it feels calming. I mean, it just takes so much energy to push up and out. And I think gravity, Saturn, has a nice quality to it of bringing things down and in. It's like a honing, centering, crystallizing, distilling force. And especially at this moment in time, right? Especially under this alignment. It's an uphill battle to try to go up and out under Saturn Pluto. And I think the hmm. both, you know, both the right move, but also the strategic move and the move that's in step with the time is what we're talking about here. The, the way to, to deal with Saturn Pluto isn't to try to ignore it and get away. Right. That's this that's this repressive, problematic uh, expression of it. But instead to to bring awareness, to bring light as the reckoning does to these things that are happening on the base level. Well, and you know, and thinking about this piece on being human and normalizing things, you know, one aspect of, of Saturn Pluto is extreme fear. I mean, Saturn relates to our fears, our worries, our concerns, our problems. And again, Pluto can make things very extreme. 
And so we can go into extreme fear and extreme paranoia and extreme isolation. I mean, part of the coronavirus, right, Mm -hmm. is it's requiring us to put up greater practices of mindfulness, of healthy boundaries and hygiene. I mean, really, we should all be washing our hands all the time and being conscientious of how we spread ourselves through our germs around the world. And also, you know, we should be coughing into our elbow or into a Kleenex anyways, or sneezing into it anyways. Like that's just like an ethic of care, of good hygiene, of being around people. Right. And what if we, and what if we take that and transfer it to the level of psychic hygiene, Mm. you know? In terms of psychic hygiene, we should also be coughing into our arms. We shouldn't be, mm. you know, letting our psychic material just out all over the world and all over everyone else. We should be mindful about how other people's energy comes into our space and how ours goes into, goes into theirs. And so I think there's also a, a bit of a, an analogy that we can, we can think about here with the coronavirus on a psychic level. I mean, it's interesting, right? Because like part of it is true. Like there are very real Saturn boundaries that are having to be put in place mm-hmm. that can create a certain level of separation, mm-hmm. right? And, and, and that, that can be isolating. Absolutely. Um, there is a real quality of physical isolation. I mean, people are being quarantined, but then also, um, you know, if you don't want to get it, practices are being put into place to say, hey, you know, you should, probably shouldn't shake hands anymore. And you should consider, you know, not really touching people because people can carry this for up to a week or two, not even knowing they have it. And, you know, it, on the one hand, it's like, what's that balance between being realistic, Saturn, and practical, Saturn, and what's the balance between, okay, you know, and you take that to an overly extreme place, you know, that that can then create paranoia and, and yeah, kind of a lockdown, imprisonment, which is also what Saturn-Pluto can do. Right, and, I mean, psychically, we, we often point out that we're we're so walled from each other and a lot of you know some of the work that we're trying to do is is to open ourselves to one another and to be able to share our our inner lives and especially in our society we're so we're so walled up psychically to one another but even in those situations there's a balance to be achieved and i think it's important it's important too that we we be honest with ourselves about who we are we were we were talking earlier about how i'm a moon saturn person and sometimes I need to I need to work to bring those barriers down. But other people aren't Moon Saturn and you know, sometimes other people need to work on containing themselves a little bit more. Are you talking about me right now? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, you can be honest here. This is the great reckoning. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right now the 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 Jupiter, Saturn, Pluto, and, and very soon Mars is square my moon, right? So I'm going through Saturn square my moon. You're born with it. And honestly, you've been my mantra. I mean, I when I have a hard moment with the Saturn moon, because it's not natural for me, I'm moon Uranus. So in many ways, I'm the opposite, right? You, you said earlier, playful and youthful and very, you know, forthcoming and outright. And everybody would say that about me. Um, and, you know... So when I'm having kind of a difficulty with the the change in energy, you know, I just visualize you and I imagine you and, you know, they they say this, they say, imagine someone that you know, who's really mm, successful at whatever they do that you're wanting to be like, like that quality, they carry that quality that you want to be like. And by simply imagining that person, Mm. you are more likely to embody Um, that energy and so I'll just kind of imagine you and I'll be like okay Saturn moon Saturn moon you know Travis how would Travis deal with this what's this like for Travis and you know and it's been very helpful for me Um, but I think that what this is doing and it's maybe a little bit of a segue is like um, we have we have to look at where this world transit is that we're all in together right I mean the coronavirus what's happening in the political scene in the United States right both of these things without a doubt, affect every single person on this planet. And where this alignment is in aspect to our chart shows us 
where our own personal reckoning is. And by reckoning, it's not just that facing of the past, right? But it's really, I just want everyone to take a moment and to think for a second. If you're being very honest with yourself, what are the unresolved issues in your life that you've been carrying with you maybe your entire life? Mm -hmm. That's what we're looking at here. We're looking at those places of tenderness and, 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 and pain and potentially shame and, and hiddenness in oneself. It could be secrets. It could be that which has been forgotten, that which has not been addressed, right? Wounds and traumas. Like, what is that for you? Like, if you can really, like, can distill that into one or two things, maybe, you know, a small handful of things, right? Let's be gentle with ourselves about it. What is that for you? And I bet you anything that the timing of this moment of the collective great reckoning aligns with the part of your chart for you personally that has to do with where that is in your life, right? And that's gonna be different for each of us. But that's kind of how I'm holding the opportunity and the responsibility of what this moment is, right? And that's a very Jupiter Saturn theme. Opportunity and responsibility. For sure. And, you know, to bring in the Mars, it's like to be called to action, right? To have the courage and the strength to do something about it. And yes, Mars, Mars drives us, right? It activates our will, our third chakra to go and, and take action. And inevitably, <laughs> as the god of war, it does. It brings in conflict and it's real. Like things are very, very, very heated and contentious right now across the board. And one thing to think about as this Mars comes in tighter is that directive, is that initiative going to come from you or is it going to come from the outside? And there's a, there's a way of working with Mars transit that transits that if, if you take a step forward, if you take the initiative in facing some of this stuff, it might not have to come from the outside. It might ha not have to, to blindside you or confront you. And we can, we can, we can jump in the driver's seat and take the, take the wheel with Mars so that we don't feel as, as jerked around and confronted from it by the outside. Well, I, I think that you're, you know, you're reminding me now why especially this month is so important here in March again until about April 18th with Mars in the alignment, Capricorn that moves into Aquarius and moves out. You know, what's going to happen in uh, middle of July, Mars will be in Aries and it's going to square a 90 degree angle to Jupiter, Saturn, Pluto. So now it's conjunct, then it's going to move into the next quadrature alignment of the square and that from um, July 20th or so, all the way through January of next year, 2021, Mars will be square, the Jupiter, Saturn, Pluto. And the reason that is, is because Mars is gonna retrograde. It's gonna go backwards um, beginning September 10th at 28 degrees Aries. It's gonna station retrograde. It's gonna go back about 13 degrees to 15 degrees Aries and station direct, move forward again on November 13th. So it's gonna be retrograde for half of September, all of October and half of November, just going over, back over the Jupiter, Saturn, Pluto, right? Where it is right now. And then as it moves forward again, it doesn't move out of the alignment until a month into next year. That's six months. That's half a year of Mars in this alignment. And that's all leading up and election day happens right at the kind of the heart of it. I mean, about four months in or so, but right. And all, everything leading up to election day. Right. So, you know, we're going to see a lot of debate. We're going to see a lot of back and forth. We're going to see a lot of tension and heatedness and conflict and aggression. These are all qualities of Mars, but we're also going to see the warrior come through with strength and courage and bravery, standing up for what's right, for what's just, right? So Jupiter Pluto has this quality of the high drama, you know, the geopolitical stage. It's just like high drama. I mean, it's, it's, it's high drama, right? 
all our lives right now are making for excellent theater. I mean, I swear to God, you could probably write a play about what's going on in every person's <laughs> life right now, let alone what's going on in the world. This has got that Jupiter-Pluto quality, you know? Well, and this is this col collective parallel to personal that we've been talking about earlier, and to just mention my personal example, we said I was, I was born in 82 with the same four planet stellium. The four planet stellium now is squaring my natal stellium. And so pretty much anyone born in 82 is, is going through this. The stellium in Capricorn is squaring where the stellium was in Libra. And also in 82, it was, it was a really long uh, conjunction of Mars because it also went retrograde then. And so this uh, similar long retrograde that we're going to get moving into 2021 has some resonance with uh, what happened for the generation born in 82. Mm, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, for all you 82ers out there, go get them, Tiger. I mean, this is really a special moment for you, a really special moment. And, you know, for the rest of us, you know, particularly if you have anything in mid to late Capricorn, this is going to be very potent for you, but really in any of the cardinal signs. So opposite mm -hmm. that in Cancer, Aries or Libra, you know, if you have any planets there from, oh, about, let's say 14 degrees to all the way to the end of the sign, you know, you're personally getting super activated right now. And what I, what I want to say is I kind of want to return back to actually this is something that's kind of been floating in my mind and I'm just starting to give voice to, which is going back to like the personal reckoning, right? And how we can mm -hmm. see that through where this alignment is happening in, in relationship to your own chart. You know, for example, if, if you have this going over your descendant, right? That's the energy you bring in from the outside. It has to do with your relationships. It has to do with the other. Like this focus is the great reckoning for you is going to really be about confronting your relational dynamics and, and, and the types of relationships you're in, the type of people you've been in relationships with, and really facing that, you know? And that could be facing your attachment style, that could be facing, um, you know, having to really look at who, who you've, who's who been keeping company with you and the, the very real impact and effects that that has had in shaping your life and the quality of your life in this moment that you're in. Um, if it's um, on your son, then, you know, the great reckoning is really, you know, on yourself and your identity, your mission, this life, your sense of purpose, your ego, um, you know, really taking a good look at, you know, who you are and um, how you get your sense of self. Um, you know, this reckoning is a very personal experience that then becomes a conglomerate of all our very personal experiences. And what you see thematically is no matter who you are, you're addressing these themes in some way. Like none of us is outside of having to address these themes. And, you know, a lot I think is coming up for people around issues around power and control. Mm -hmm. um, how uh, a lot of things, themes are coming up around sexuality, right? Um, a lot of things are coming up around um, people's shame and, 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 and trying to understand what power means to them. Um, feelings of power and feelings of powerlessness and, 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 and really encountering ways that we can feel really inferior and inadequate and out of control. And I'll mention that just through all of this, let's think about the, the Mars-Saturn too. There's really a a grinding long haul quality to it and i just invite you all to think about it as a marathon and really there's mm. some endurance that's needed because i think we all feel it already this has just been grinding and going and it's non-stop every day you see it on the world stage and a lot of few people are feeling it on their personal stage as well this isn't something that's going to be Quick. resolved mm. in a blip this this is something that's going to take real patience and stick to itiveness. Uh, so pace yourself. Yeah, I think that that's really important, right? Mars Saturn has that quality of the sustained energy, the energizer bunny that keeps going mm -hmm. and going, but at a certain pace, you know, you're a long distance runner, you're born with Mars Saturn. Mm -hmm. I'm Mars Uranus, I'm a sprinter, I'm a cheetah, you know, you're not a turtle. Uh, what are you? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Whatever. You kick my ass when it comes to running long I'm distances. An <laughs> You're an antelope. I kind of look like an antelope. Um, but like... Since I've been with you, I've started to to run, right? right. I was very resistant to it at first. Extremely. Yeah, I had a tantrum one time when we went jogging outside together when we were living in Berkeley. And we were running, and I I couldn't keep up, and I'm very competitive. And if I'm not the fastest, a sprinter, I don't like to do it. And I couldn't keep up, and I literally broke down in the middle of a street and started screaming and stomping my feet and i was just like i don't want to do this i just and you were like okay okay let's go back and i was like don't you pity me don't you dare pity me go on i'm just go on without me and you were like you looked mortified you were like wait am i supposed to leave you or am i supposed to go no way to win there was no way to win it was impossible and i was like no seriously go (laughs) but anyways now very different situation. We don't run together mostly. Except we did run down the beach together the day. No, we did. And that was fun. That was very fun. That was actually really cool. Okay, but anyways, what are we talking about? So anyways, yeah, this sustained long distance. What, something you always say to me in running when I get tired. I'm like, I don't know if I can make it. You're like, just slow down. And I'm like, huh? And you're like, just slow down. Just find that sweet spot where you could just run forever. As slow as you want. Just that place that you could keep going. Mm, and I I feel like, yeah, that's what you're saying this time mm, is. It's like yeah. to slow down to that pace that we can actually mm. endure and, and sustain. Because obviously, every, so much is being asked of every person right now. And it's, it's hard. These are hard times. Like we're being so tested. And whew, you know... It, and so what else do we know is really good for, for marathons and long distance is practice, mm-hmm. training, discipline, stretching, right? right? Before and after, like taking time to stretch and be flexible. Be nourished. Mm-hmm. You know, I think I want to bring in one last thing here at, at, at the end of our time. And... That is you know, talking about Saturn again and, and boundaries. You know, this is becoming a very um, kind of pop word, I think. And um, we were talking about this the other day that there's, there's three components of Saturn that are important to understand. And I feel like when we start having psychological and emotional education, by the time we're five years old, children will not only be able to know how to name their emotions, but they'll also be able to clearly speak what their um, limitations are and their boundaries. So we all have limitations, right? There are things that we cannot do for whatever reason. It's a limit. Boundaries are the thing that come before a limit to protect us, to safeguard us from having to hit the limit. Because when we hit the limit, it tends to really, really, really stress us out. It can be dangerous it when can you be go dangerous. beyond your limits or even up to your limits. Right. So we have limits, and then before that we have our boundaries, which requires, through trial and error, another component of Saturn, to discover where our boundaries, which are always kind of moving and evolving as we grow, where they are to keep us safe so that we don't have to hit those limits. And then before the boundaries, we have one other thing, which is our edge. And the edge is the growth edge. It's that place that we can come in and out of, which is called titration. We lean in and then we step out. We lean in and we step out and we are working our edge. So when we're growing or we're stretching ourselves or we're kind of moving into where we're uncomfortable and then coming back, it's like the two-year-old that's at the playground with the parent and they come in together and then the two-year-old runs towards the slide, looks back at the parent. The parent's like, go get them. The two-year-old goes to the slide and then does it and then comes back and holds the parent's leg again. I'm seeing like a, another running analogy for this. If you, if, you, if you run beyond your limits, you're going to hurt yourself. You're going to pull a hamstring if you push yourself too hard. That's where your limit is. 
but your edge you're trying to when you work out in any manner you're trying to to push that edge so that your muscles get stronger you break them down they build back up each day when you run or you can think of a kind of per uh, periodic sprinting interval sprinting when you're running and then you sprint and then you slow back down regain your energy you sprint again or doing a kick at the end of your run if you push that too hard though you're going to hurt yourself so there's a, so there's a boundary there so you don't hurt yourself and then there's that spot that you lean into to to help the growth and help you become stronger and being it be able to to move those limits and those boundaries in ways that you choose to grow mm, i like that and that's a, you know a perfect analogy you know, mars is is athleticism right i like how the archetypes are coming in in the analogies that we're using right. I think that part of the poetic nature of speaking archetypally, um, and you're really good at this, Travis, because you're so great with analogies, is using the appropriate analogy or metaphor that is resonantly true for that energy. And so it's very apropos to use something like running with Mars, and then in this case, long distance running with Mars Saturn. So we're going to wrap up this stream are there any last thoughts or reflections or anything at all that you'd like to say or share or ask or whatever thank you for sharing this time with me it was a lovely venus uranus surprise and i think we mars saturn sustained throughout oh thank you so much for saying yes and for being such an amazing husband. I was working my edge. <laughs> yes, you were. Good <laughs> job. You so were working your edge today. This was edgy. And I think you did awesome. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for being in this sacred conversation in the stream today. We're sending all our love and blessings and sustained good fortune to all of you. Take extra good care of yourselves during this time, and we will see you very soon. This is Stream, and I'm Jessica Deruta, here with Dr. D.